Uh, Native American Heritage Month is about embracing diversity and celebrating our culture and celebrating you know what's unique about Native people and also what's similar. So um, let's let's go through some of these things that we see in Indian country. You know um, that as a Native person. So what is the history of Native American heritage? By the way, are you impressed with this stuff flying around on the screen? I'm, I, I did a lot of work on that. <laughs> So November is Native American Heritage Month, and the day after Thanksgiving is Native American Heritage Day. And this, by the way, these dancers, if you look here, you can see um, several, I don't know if you can see my mouse on here, but this, this young lady here, uh, she is, uh, you know, have these beautiful ribbons, and she's dancing with a shawl, she's a dancer, in, and these ribbons are, are a part of a specific style of dance, these ribbon, uh, these ribbons are flowing and the shawl dancers, the fancy shawls, uh, you will see this type of dance. And if you look back in the back here, uh, this young lady here has small bells on her dress and that is Jingle Bell Dancer. So her dance style is a, a dance of healing. So both two very beautiful styles of dance. And I'll try to uh, kind of let you know as we go through the slideshow uh, and things about what each person kind of represents in their culture and the beautiful colors and all of these colors represent family colors and family connections and it's, it's just a beautiful uh, beautiful set of images here and a lot of um, beautiful images that I've been so uh, fortunate to be able to take over the years here in Hampton Roads all over the country uh, and more so uh, Native American Heritage Month started in 1990, and that was President George H. Walker Bush. He approved a joint resolution uh, designating November as National Native American Indian Heritage Month, or National American Indian Heritage Month. And uh, Native American Heritage Day uh, was first supported in uh, 2007 by the National Indian Gaming Association, and 184 recognized tribes came forward and said, Look, we need to designate this year, November 28th in 2008, as a day to pay tribute for Native Americans for their many contributions. And that was Resolution 62 in 2007. So thanks, George, and thanks uh, National Indian Gaming Association for working to get those taken care of for us. So, uh, so let's talk about tribal recognition. You know, what is tribal recognition? If you see in this photo here, I have Chief Gray, and this is the Pamunkey Reservation. This is here in Virginia. And why did I choose Pamunkey for this particular image? Because the Pamunkey is the closest to both state and federal recognition. They just turned um, federally recognized in February. And uh, they had been fighting a long battle with the Bureau of Indian Affairs to become recognized and federally recognized. And it's very interesting that they uh, have one of the oldest reservations in the country yet literally as of up till now were the last to be recognized but if you think about first contact with the people that came and and interacted with with native tribes it makes sense that the tribes would be in fear would disperse or or unfortunately due to wartime situations um you know be killed or hurt or or just caused to move and up up uh, uproot from where they were so uh, the Pamunkey, you know, congratulations to them for getting their, their recent federal recognition, uh, which, which does quite a bit. So, uh, hey, thanks, VP. Appreciate you tweeting it out live. Um, you guys, I, I really do appreciate you all so very much. You know, um, so let's talk about federal recognition in just one second. You know what I'm going to do is tweet this out as well. So let's see here. There we go. I'm tweeting this out here. Native American Heritage Month event hosted by the Schilling and um, live now. So I love you guys. <laughs> it's just so so cool to to be part of this. All right, let's tweet that out, and I'm gonna go to my other tweets and let's tweet this out someplace else too. I'm gonna tweet it out on all my a couple accounts um, in just a moment. So, all right, so. In order to receive federal recognition, you know, and there are tribes that have gone about this for decades. It has taken tribes decades to become federal recognized. And when you are federally recognized, you, you can receive a lot of benefits in terms of government funding. You are recognized as a government entity uh, at a federal level. At, at a federal level. 
uh, you are granted government to government sort of uh, interactions uh, and you can get funding from the Bureau of Indian Affairs and other uh, organizations that offer funding to uh, you know federal entities and uh, it is it is something uh, not just so, not just for a financial matter but the independence and the sense of being recognized is an important thing to, to native people and um, you know uh, in order to receive federal recognition, I went through and put very briefly the criteria that you have to do. You have to self-identify, and that's at least from the 1900 to the present. Now, obviously, tribes go uh, much, much farther back than that, but that is the, the legitimate requirement of, of at least to the 1900s. Uh, you have to prove that you have been a continuous community uh, from first contact, um, and you have to prove that you have leaders within the tribe that are influencers or problem solvers or people who have uh, been turned to throughout the generations. Um, you have to have governing documents that show tribal membership criteria or documents that show the tribal government, and which is very interesting because a lot of tribes uh, through the years went through uh, oral tradition and didn't have uh, necessarily written documents uh, documenting their their governments and and uh, you know so this is a very interesting thing to try and uh, locate these types of records you know when so many things are oral orally uh, help you know passed down uh, I have to prove descendants tribal members have to show historical descendants this is through historical uh, connections to your tribe and make sure the course the last Two is not make sure that you're not already federally recognized or have been previously terminated. So, that is uh, the 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 criteria for federal recognition. Let me go ahead and tweet this out. Um, okay, let's see. Don't know why it's not doing it now here. All right, I'll go back to it in a minute. So, um, so the next, let's go to um, in terms of federal recognition currently. There are 567 federal rec uh, federally recognized tribes. 567, and I, I did a video. Check it out if pe you, know, um, you know how many federally recognized tribes. Where people came up with me and said things like five. You know they didn't know. Uh, someone was like 200, and and as of 2008, and I was looking for statistics on state recognized tribes because I I, I um, didn't know the exact numbers, and the only numbers I could find were two, since 2008, which there are 62 tribes with state recognition, uh, but that's not including uh, non-recognized tribes by the state. So there are several, tri several tribes, uh, and I, I would suspect it's much, much more than that. So, so let's talk about Native veterans. Um, and I am a veteran myself. Uh, I served in the U.S. Army uh, as former lieutenant, uh, field artillery. I was also a combat medic, lab technician, and served for just over nine years and uh, there's a lot of interesting factoids about uh, native veterans that a lot of people don't realize and this was a uh, gentleman here uh, you know is wearing a roach and this roach on top of his head generally are made with the softer uh, por porcupine quills and he's got these you know breastplates you can see he's also has his ribbons here and that's a Vietnam ribbon and uh, you know this gentleman uh, has a lot of pride and a lot of native pride as well as veteran pride. So there's a lot of med military uh, connection to native people. So a lot of people don't realize that uh, Native Americans have enlisted and joined the military at a higher rate per capita, even though they're the smallest population, than any other ethnicity in the United States. And you may not realize that code talkers, you know, um, have the only unbroken code in military history. And um, did you know, though natives are the smallest population, if every race joined and enlisted at the rate of Native Americans in World War II, the draft and selective service would not have been necessary. And that fact has always kind of been like, wow, I didn't know that. Um, and in 1942, 99% of all eligible Native American males that were aged 21 to 44 registered for the draft. 99% registered for the draft. 99%. And 40% more Native Americans enlisted than were drafted. So the amount of people that they drafted, there was 40% more of Native Americans that enlisted voluntarily. So it's pretty amazing statistics if you really think about it. Um, tweet this out one more time. 
Um, so when I say first contact in 1492, you know, uh, VP, I'll tell you. Um, yes, I know about the Chinook, exactly. Yes, federal government has, yeah, the, the, I've heard quite a bit about that. But VP, no, please, please, this is the place to ask questions. And um, these are things we haven't been taught you know, and I understand that. And it's this is no shame in not knowing this stuff. You know, I am a uh, Mohawk, uh, and I didn't learn a lot of this until I was out of school completely. Um, so when I say first contact, and I'll talk about Columbus in just a second. Uh, no, I don't mean 1492, because, you know, Columbus actually never made it to the upper 48 states ever, ever. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. But when I say first contact, I mean about the 1600s about the arrival of John Smith in 1607. Uh, so when I say first contact, that means first contact with the settlers that have, have made contact with him. Now that obviously goes for Virginia. Tribes that were further in uh, towards the West Coast uh, would, would of course be elevated um, years wise. So please do not feel as though you have to apologize for not knowing something. If anything, I am absolutely thrilled that you are here and you're asking a question and I get to answer it because I feel as though I'm sharing something. So I am honored that you're asking a question and I am honored that I get to answer it. So please, I, I if anyone would like to ask a question, please, please do. I, I appreciate it very, very much. And I will do my best I can to answer everything that I can. So, um, so you know, it's again, like I said, I'll go back 99% in 1942 register for the draft. And that's ages 21 to 44, 99%. Just amazing. So let me tell you a fact about Pocahontas. And this is talking about first contact VP. I, I'm sure you haven't learned some of this in school. Um, you know, just some of the, I'm gonna go over a couple historical figures, you know, certainly not all of them. Uh, we'd be here all day, which would be amazing anyway. But uh, there's a fact about Pocahontas, who's the beloved daughter of Chief Palatine, who named Wahoon Seneca. So, um, so the interesting thing about 1607 is the time that John Smith came in, and that is first contact. As a matter of fact, the park out here in Virginia is called First Landing State Park for a reason. Uh, the beloved daughter of Chief, the Chief of the Palatine, while in Seneca, uh, Pocahontas, never loved John Smith. You know why? Because in 1607, Pocahontas was about nine years old. <laughs> You know, thus the small graphic there was she's a little kid. So there's a lot of very interesting things about Pocahontas that people don't know. And I have that in the next slide. Hold, hold on one second. Let me take a sip. So, uh, you know, interestingly enough about Pocahontas. Um, first, number one, she was kidnapped and imprisoned. Number two, she was forced to give up her first baby. Little Quoki. She had a little baby who was a baby girl uh, by a, a native, a native brave, uh, Coquim, and she was married to him before she was kidnapped. Uh, she was married to a native man. Uh, she now I want you to before I just go from married to a native man to had to marry John Rolfe. Imagine this: her mother, Pocahontas's mother, died giving birth to her. Pocahontas, when she turned about 16 at a coming-of-age ceremony, changed her name to Pocahontas, her mother's name, her mother who died. She changed her name to her mother's name who died. She was married to a young man, Kokum. She had a baby, and then she was kidnapped. They killed her husband. She was forced to give up her baby. She was taken to Jamestown and eventually converted to Christianity changed her name to Rebecca, and was married to John Rolfe. Now, people say, well, she lovingly converted, and she lovingly changed her name, but I find it very hard to believe. In my 10 years of research, talking with tribal historians and tribal people, I find it extremely hard to believe that someone would want to give up the name of their mother who died and would want to marry a man, uh, and the reason he married her is because his tobacco was not very good, he wanted the native recipe because the native recipe was even better than the Spanish, and the Spanish were outselling John Rolfe. So he wanted the native recipe. And Pocahontas, who was a niece to the holy men who knew the sacred tobacco curing techniques, if he married Pocahontas, he'd be entitled to those uh, recipes. 
which he did. And then what happened? He took her to England with John Argall, who had kidnapped her, paraded her all around England once she, they got the funding and the tobacco recipe. Suddenly they had dinner. She was poisoned. She vomited after dinner and died. It's not a happy story that people try to put. So the fact that Pocahontas was referred to to Elizabeth Warren just this week during a uh, Code Talker ceremony is really, is really um, in poor taste. So let's talk about Columbus. Now you were asking about Columbus. <laughs> um, yes, yes, Lisa has written quite a bit. Uh, check out Lisa Elwood on Indian Country Today, some of her articles on federal recognition, absolutely. So let's, let's talk about Columbus. Uh, he is one of the most atrocious figures in indigenous history. He killed, imprisoned, and enslaved native people, and let's not even talk about what his men did to native women, native babies, native men. It was not pretty. It was very, very, uh, very, very atrocious, and um, you know, not a man who should be celebrated. And let me just say, I am not anti-Italian. I am anti-Columbus. You know, he took the name in the name of Spain. He just came. Oh, this is mine, and he never ever ever landed in the upper 48 states ever he landed in uh the essentially uh what be modern day hispaniola uh you know the the caribbean and he did not land in the upper 48 states ever 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 he did not discover america he never landed in the upper 48 states ever never did is terrible man so you could check out my article uh, 10 myths and atrocities of christopher columbus and columbus day so uh this picture here as you can see is a iroquois uh, onondaga chief standing uh in the midst of our forefathers in the uh national congress and that is the iroquois confederacy and they are the guiding voices of our u.s constitution a lot of people don't realize the iroquois confederacy guided the creation of our constitution but the iroquois nation met with you know um the leaders of that day all the time you know and on um, june 11th 1776 when they were talking about this independence and the declaration of independence and the constitution you know visiting iroquois chiefs were invited into the hall of the continental continental congress and an onondaga chief requested permission to give john hancock an Indian name, John Hancock, the biggest signer. And the, the Congress graciously consented. And so the president of the Second Continental Congress, John Hancock, was renamed Karanduan, or the Great Tree. So the Iroquois Confederacy is the model for the system of checks and balances in today's United, Straight, United States democratic governmental system. So Iroquois nation leaders, and, and go back to this real quick. Do you see this belt that they're holding? right? That is a wampum treaty belt, okay? And Iroquois Nation leaders have been coming to the Washington, D.C. annually for the past 220, well, it'd be 223 years now in honor of the Treaty of Canandueca. So the treaty was signed on November 11th, 1794 by members of the Iroquois Nation and by official agent of President George Washington, Colonel Timothy Pickering. Uh, the treaty is sometimes called the Pickering Treaty. So um, you have to think that how amazing that is that for 222 years they've been coming to D.C. And they've been holding true to that treaty every single year. And I was honored to have been invited. So uh, I just wanted to make this real quick. And I, I probably should have put this. Now that I'm looking at I probably should have put this at the beginning of the presentation. But, you know. So... Just so you know, I don't speak for all Native people. I speak about Native culture from my own path, life, and experiences. You know, but there are some similarities as well as differences in Native culture. But that disclaimer should have been should have, now I'm looking at it. I should, probably should have been at the beginning, but that's okay. At least I said it right. <laughs> so let's talk about Native stereotypes, right? What are some truths versus some myths? And I love this photograph. I love this. These two guys. Uh, uh, also at the Richmond Pow Wow, just a great moment. Uh, they were competing against each other uh, during a men's traditional dance. And you could tell by these beautiful bustles they have on their backs and their headdresses and ornate regalia. 
um, you know, and they were they were competing against each other. And right after competition, you know, um, I just happened to catch this moment of genuine uh, interaction and pleasantries that they shared, and it just was a really um, a really wonderful moment, you know. And I, I just I just love this photograph. So uh, we're, let's talk about native stereotypes. So what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to tweet again the live event we have happening here. Um, so bear with me just one second. Let me just tweet this out one more time because I'm reaching over to my laptop. So uh, that way I can tweet it out. Okay, here we go. Thanks for bearing with me, everybody. And let's put, uh, I don't know why it's not working suddenly. Okay, I guess we'll go back to there. Okay, so let's, um, I'm just trying to tweet here, so bear with me for a second, friends and neighbors. There we go. All right, live now. Here we go. Okay. So um, when we're talking about native stereotypes, uh, this is something I literally actively face every single day. Um, I mean, if you think about it, I'm in Virginia, you know, the heart of Redskins territory, you know, um, and there are a lot of Redskins fans here. And I try to be respectful of anyone's position on something. Now, personally, I don't, um, I don't uh, like the name. I do uh, agree that it is a dictionary defined racial slur. Um, I respect anyone who feels differently, um, but I will say that I would politely disagree that it is not offensive, but I do believe it is offensive. Uh, so let's, let's talk about some native stereotypes here. So, uh, as you can see this, this picture here of this, this young man saying, really, you don't look like an Indian, uh, considering all these things. Uh, I think that's written by Brock, oh gosh, Bronca Branch. I'd like to give proper credit to the gentleman who, who wrote that. So, number one, yes, we do vote. Native Americans do get to vote. <laughs> so, uh, number two, yes, we do actually have to pay taxes. Yes, we do have to pay taxes. Uh, we don't go, woo, 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 and slap our mouths. In my entire life, I've never known another Native person that has done that, other than when I'm saying we don't go, woo, woo, woo. That's the only time I've ever seen it or ever talked about it or joke about it. Uh, I've seen it when I was a kid, and you know, people would play cowboys and Indians. Of course, the kids would always do that. That played the Indians, uh, but no, I've never seen it done in my life. <laughs> we do go, lee, 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 lee. you know, that that is something we do do. So I guess, I guess uh, the actors were unable to go, lee, 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 you know, so they had to go, lee, 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 or who, I, you know, <laughs> I'm not. No, I will not repeat that. <laughs> so. So, um, not everyone lives on a reservation, right? Uh, there are just as many urban, if uh, not many more, uh, that don't live on reservations. And let me go through and make sure I'm uh, listening here. Uh, John Smith is buried in England. Um, let's see. Member sitting in the Chinook office waiting for Secretary of State to call only to have them put it off another month. Yeah, I, I know. I know, my goodness. Yeah, it, it's... <sighs> can be time consuming. Am I right? <laughs> Many times talking about some federal recognition and process with the government, etc. So, and number five, we all know that one native guy, you know, we don't all know that one native guy, you know, from Texas, you know, and I say that in lightheartedness, but a lot of times when I say I'm Native American, someone will go, oh, you know, uh, you know, John, <laughs> he's from Kentucky. He's native. You know, I get that all the time, you know, uh, so you know, I, I say that in a lighthearted way, but um, you know, something where, where people tend to generalize a lot about native people, which is why I say I don't, I don't speak for all native people, I speak for myself. But one funny generalization that uh, you know, uh, my wife Dolores was telling me uh, just before that, she's like, oh yeah, you know how people say, you know, I love Native Americans. And, and our response is, oh, really? You know all, all of them. <laughs> you know, so, you know, we are just as much of a distinct person, um, you know, as anyone else. And with all distinct personalities and, you know, uh, a tribe in, uh, you know, Alaska is not going to wear the same thing as a tribe in Florida. So you can imagine regalia and customs and, 
and celebrations are of course going to be different. So, um, you know, th these are just some things to, to think about in a funny way. And, you know, and I will say on, on a funny note, something about Native Americans that always irks me, you know, as a huge comic book nerd and as a huge comic fan, as a huge, I love the Marvel Universe. I love the DC Universe. I love... I love the X-Men Chronicles. I love all these shows that are about mutants and all that. You know, um, what's the guy's name on The Gifted? I can't remember his name. I, I have it in front of me. I'll have to look it up here. But he, um, he is, I, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. I'll, I'll have to look it up, but or, or otherwise it's going to drive me bonkers. But um, let's see. I have it right here. Hold on. Where is he? Where is he? I got you there, brother. I know you're here. <laughs> I'm gonna find it. I'm gonna find it. I promise. Um, but he is on the gifted. He's an actor on the gifted. And um, what is his power? Of course, he's very, very strong, right? He's a, he's a new mutant, and he's very, very strong. And what is his other power? He's an expert tracker. <laughs> <laughs> so hey, if someone if someone uh, can look him up, he's on the Gifted. He's the native guy on the Gifted. Is the Gifted is a new TV show on Fox, and I just don't have his name in front of me. I want to give him a shout if I'm calling him out and citing his name. He's doing a great job, you know. And he says he's native descendant uh, in, in real life. He he, he does. I mean, the guy looks very native. He says he's native descendant, and I would love to give him a shout out. If someone could look that up and tell me, I'll give him a shout. I just I had it in front of me and I just don't see the darn thing. Um. That's all right. Let's move on. Let's move on. Otherwise, I'll be stuck on this all day. <laughs> so, so okay. So these are some common native stereotypes, right? So um, let's then talk about since we we have talked about these stereotypes, let's talk about appropriation. And I did a video called "What Is Native American Misappropriation?" And you know, you see this a lot. Um, you look at this image of this young lady here uh, with you know her face painted and she's wearing a headdress and she's smoking a cigarette to give that kind of I'm really cool look and you know um, I don't think these young people understand the full um, effect of what this type of appropriation and cultural appropriation and appropriating and taking things on and emulating a culture without um, you know the the proper respect that it deserves is, is really hurtful. And, you know, when I say this little blue tab that says, please don't, I really, I really am asking you, you know, if you, if you find out about this, you know, uh, please don't appropriate. Uh, a native appropriation is stolen valor, and I'll explain. A feather uh, presented to a native person is considered one of the highest honors of our lifetimes. I've been presented, and I'm 50 years old, I've been, I've been given five, no, I'm sorry, four eagle feathers in my lifetime and is an incredibly high honor. So many tribes honor the feather and the eagle feather as a representation of a tremendously good deed or an act of honor. And I'm, I'm saying, please don't appropriate. Uh, for example, at a Native American powwow, if a dancer is dancing and an eagle feather is to fall off the regalia, which does happen on some occurrences, it does happen. I, I've seen it happen um, on uh, uh, a few occasions. The entire event stops. Everything stops. We're talking stops in the middle of a dance, stops in the middle of music, stops in the middle of everything. And respect is given to that one feather because that feather is believed to, um, is believed to represent a fallen warrior and they will do a fallen warrior fallen feather uh, ceremony at that time and they ask that no photos be taken they ask that it not be recorded uh, audio or video and they go through a ceremony to honor that fallen feather and to honor that fallen warrior uh, it is a very very big deal so and that is one feather so you can imagine if someone is to appropriate an entire set of regalia or, or headdress, and it's very, very harmful. And I ask you, uh, and I appeal to you folks who, who uh, um, have ever considered doing so, to, to please not. You know, I'm, I'm asking just as a courtesy, please don't, 
don't appropriate. Uh, so our culture is not a costume. It's regalia. And that's often heard, of, oh, I love your costume. And just, just so you know, uh, the proper terminology is to say, oh, that is beautiful regalia. And as you can see, the difference here of these, you know, Halloween type images, um, you know, of people uh, who look ridiculous, just to say the say the least, you know. Uh, and this is um, two gentlemen in real regalia. So our culture is not a costume; it's regalia. Um, so let's talk about native mascots. You know, and they're they're more harmful than people real, realize. This is. This is Chief Osceola, Chief Wahoo, uh, the Redskins logo. Um, you know, native mascots are something that I contend with every day. And like I said, I live in Virginia in the United States. And you can imagine the amount of, um, uh, the amount of red-skinned paraphernalia I see over and over and over again. Thank you, Cheyenne. Thank you, Cheyenne. The gentleman, his name is Blair Redford on The Gifted. Thank you, Cheyenne. I knew someone would come, come through. <laughs> she said, that awkward moment when you do know who they're talking about, though. <laughs> Thanks, Cheyenne. Appreciate it. Appreciate it very much. Hey, any relation to Arnold Printup? August Austin? Buddy of mine. Mohawk guy in, uh, in uh, August Austin. He's a good buddy of mine. Arnold Printup is the uh, cultural guy in, in Aguasasne, so thank you. Blair Redford, yes. So, um, really, he's, he's doing a good job. It's, it's a good show. Uh, so, native mascots are, are more harmful than people realize, and this is according to the National Congress of American Indians, and if you don't know, National Congress of American Indians has just um, taken on Indian country today, and that's a very exciting prospect. We'll see how things go. And this is a photograph I took of two native children at a Nottoway powwow in Virginia. And according to National Congress of American Indians, and this is not just their studies, there are many studies that say the exact same thing, and I also have personal experience I'll tell you about in just a moment, as documented in a comprehensive review of decades of social science research, derogatory Indian sports mascots have serious psychological, social, and cultural consequences for Native Americans, especially Native youth. Now, just from a personal level, I have talked to a lot of Native youth and I've asked them, what do you feel is the most destructive thing that you experience as a Native person? And they say, the mascots. And to see in their eyes how sad they feel to be misrepresented by mascots. And then to have someone say to me, well, we're, we're not offending you. We're not trying to be offensive. We're, we're, we're honoring you. And then to see what the children say, you know, really hurts my heart. And, you know, I try to go about things in a kind way and I try to go about things in a respectful way to people who may believe differently than I do. But this is something that I do feel hurts very much. And I, I want mascots to change. I really genuinely do. And I uh, don't want there to be native mascots on sports teams. And that is my personal view. Okay. Um, so, um, big family tree, big family reunion, <laughs> okay. So, Danielle, you also live in Virginia, okay. It's so irritating to see all of it, and even more irritating that, that other people of color don't have a problem with it. Well, you know, I can't speak for other people of color. Um, however, what I can say is that as a Native man, and I hear you, Danielle, I hear you, it is very frustrating that... Um, my culture is represented as a cartoon and my culture is represented uh, in such a way that people say you don't look Native American. I was at an event once where I said to this lady, I said, well, hey, blah, 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 you know, I was talking to her and she says, you don't look Native American. And I looked at her and I said, imagine me with two braids and a bandana and a feather. She goes, oh, I see it now, you know. That's where this type of stuff comes from. It's from television and stereotypes and, and sports mascots. So it's very frustrating. Am I right? It really is frustrating. So um, let's talk about native youth then. What have they gone through? You know, uh, residential schools, 
that, that started in the 1800s. It was as a way to assimilate native children away from their culture. Look at this photograph. Ugh. So imagine, the, a lot of people do not realize the importance of our hair in native culture. You know, these, these young girls with long, beautiful hair, these young boys with long, beautiful hair taken in and hair just literally hacked off with big shears. And their names were taken away. They were given English names or good Christian names. And they were abused if they spoke their language. They weren't allowed to speak their native tongue. They were physically and forcibly taken away from their families. They essentially lost their culture completely. And today, children's representation of culture is, marsed, is marred by a televised stereotype. So if you think about all this, the importance of changing all of this is tantamount. So a common argument I hear about this. Okay, so you're talking about, I'm talking about mascots. Here's a common argument I hear all the time. There are a lot of problems in Indian country to include disease, poverty, addiction, and more. Shouldn't you focus on more important things instead of mascots? So my response is, well, if you have four children, does that mean you can only love one of them at a time? Can you only love one child at a time? We are allowed to care about more issues than one at a time. You can care about several issues at a time. You know, so to say that there are more important issues, uh, an issue can be more important than the other, certainly. But it doesn't mean you can't care about more than one. You know, so let's fight some preconceived notions. Look at all these cool native dudes and, and dudettes in here. You know, uh, love this image of all these great looking folks here. So let's, let's test your perception, okay? Let's just test your perception of what you think of uh, a native person is, okay? Some of you may know, some of you may not. So let's think this, so what, let me ask what you see in your mind. So let your mind create something. So. What do you see in your mind as I tell you these things, okay? Imagine this person as chief of the Nottaway tribe, okay? Just let your mind create whatever you want to create. This person oversees tribal government, and this person has overwhelming respect by the tribe. So chief of the Nottaway tribe, imagine. What do you see in your mind? Let your mind create an image. Do you have an image in your mind? Okay. Here's the, here's the chief. Chief Lynette Alston. Now, how many of you imagined a woman? So that's just one thing to think about, one possibility to think about. So here's another possibility, okay? So this person is Choctaw, and I will say he is a man, okay? He is a leader in his community. Uh, he teaches leadership to others, and his father holds a sacred pipe from a treaty with the U.S. government, okay? So imagine a Choctaw man teaches leadership, he's a Choctaw leader. His father holds a sacred pipe from a treaty with the U.S. government. Imagine what do you see in your mind, okay? Let your mind have whatever you want in your mind, okay? Imagine a photo, right? What do you see? Anyone see a Virginia Beach police officer? <laughs> Uh, this gets a lot of people, uh, you know, and by the way, just, just to give Lieutenant Mark Bowman a shout, he actually, uh, that this is pictures a couple years old. He is actually now retired from the police force. Uh, and he is a college professor, uh, you know, I think in North Carolina, I, I can't remember exactly, but at the time that was exactly the truth. So, you know, just goes to show our minds can conceive of. So here's an easy one, right? Question mark. Imagine two native Americans in the forest, all right? Imagine two Native Americans in the forest, okay? What do you see? And the reveal. <laughs> the Golden Eagles hotshots. You know, now these guys uh, are, are really cool, cool guys. I met uh, uh, in the uh, brush and forest lands of North Carolina. They had flown all the way from El Cajon, San Diego. Um, and uh, you know there are a, a lot of a lot of tribes have golden eagle hotshot 
uh, firefighting crews, forest fight firefighting crews. And they showed me the ropes of uh, firefighting like I'd never seen. Like they, they don't use water. They clear away brush to stop the forest fires and just amazing work they've done. But that's two natives in the forest. So, all right, here's the last one. All right, in his day, spoke with our nation's senators and presidential candidates about native issues. This person traveled across the country talking about native people overcoming great difficulties to succeed. And this person is wolf clan of his tribe and is cousin to his tribe's chief and has consulted with him, uh, the chief for perspective. Who is this person? What is the image you see in your mind? And the reveal is me. <laughs> Yes, I'm Wolf Clan. My native name is Joe Gualis, and uh, yes, I am cousin to the chief. Well, former chief, actually. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about some native celebrations and ceremonies. So as you can see, look at these beautiful uh, shawls here with ribbons and fancy shawl dancers, you know, looking amazing here. And this is the Richmond Pow Wow. And, uh, you know, uh, let me tell you what a powwow is. A powwow is an annual or multi-annual celebration that combines the celebration of dance, song, and drum. These events are open to the public and show how we as Native people come together to share friendship, family, news, and a cultural connection. I just love this picture. Um, that is the Chickahominy powwow. And look at that little guy. You know, it says, I love mommy. <laughs> oh, so looking cool. Cool shot there. I love that shot. So and let's talk about the drum. So the native drum is a sacred part of native culture. Uh, it's thought of as the heartbeat of Mother Earth and adding our native voice to this drum is in alignment with Mother Earth's heart and keeps us on the good path. And this is a photo of Eastern Sky Drum. And that was the uh, Nansman powwow uh, a couple years back. So, all right, so let me ask you, uh, let me double check. Oh yes, it, uh, to see someone's hair cut off, yikes, ouch, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, 48 school native mascots in Cheyenne's hometown. Wow. Whew. Wow. Well, at least your ma helped take down a few. That's that's great. That's great. So, um, yeah, your mo yeah, yes, Arnold Printup is Mohawk. So you're Tusker. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'm talking about Arnold Printup, who's a cultural advisor at Mohawk Tribe. So, so all right, guys, let's guess. Are these guys Native American, yes or no? All right? So Native American, yes or no? You can tell yourself yes or no. You know, and obviously I can't hear you. So <laughs> this young this young office worker, Native American, yes or no? This Danny Garneau, yep, Native American, yes, no. This business guy, Native American, name is Brad, Brad Scott. This this uh, this guy who is a. Uh, uh, let's say rock star, I guess I'd say, huh? Name's Mickey. <laughs> this senator, senator guy. This business guy looking, he's actually a hip-hop artist. Hockey player, is this native, yes or no? Yes, no, yes, no. This skier, Ross Anderson, skier, yes, yes, no. This gentleman in a, in a, in a turban, is he Native American, yes, no, yes. All right, oh, went too far. <laughs> This guy, all right, all those Native Amer all those people, every single one of them, yes, 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 yes. Every one of them are Native American, except for SpongeBob. <laughs> I don't know, maybe that guy was, I don't know. <laughs> so, all right, let's, let's, let's give a couple quick thoughts to matriarchy um, and, and what matriarchy means in... Native culture. Um, so, uh, for example, Mohawk. Uh, you know, I personally view women and Native women as very sacred, and women in general as sacred. Uh, in the Iroquois tradition, there is a council of women elders who, if a chief got to be a jerk or a butthead, could dehorn him. And essentially, if a if an Iroquois uh, chief, uh, if an Iroquois man became chief, he was given a kastawa of antlers and he could be dehorned in other words his antlers removed and removed from chief uh if because the women were thought to be very knowledgeable and wise and raised the men of the tribe and knew him uh, implicitly 
And I had a man said to me one time, well, well, then what's the point of being chief? I'm like, I, I thought that's exactly the point of being chief. If you can't be the type of person who can lead people without want to be removed, you shouldn't be. So um, something about a belt of wampum that you should know that in Iroquois, Iroquois nations that uh, uh, during a time of war, if a native man was killed, the family was given a belt of wampum. If a native woman was killed, she was given two belts. The family was given two belts because a woman was considered uh, much more valuable uh, because of herself, her sacredness, and the sacred lives that would have come after her. Uh, native women are sacred, yet are subject to three times the amount of negative and sad circumstance of life regarding assault and more. Uh, there's school, schools potentially watching, so I'm not going to go too much into it. Uh, but if you're curious, uh, look up the hashtag MMIW. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about some of these amazing native people. For example, Ross Anderson is a downhill speed skiing champion. Uh, Sherry Becerra Madsen, Olympic and Paralympic wheelchair racing champion. We have Ben Nighthorse Campbell, the gentleman on the right sitting, standing next to me. He was an Olympic judo champion, a retired senator. Uh, Stephanie Murata is a female wrestling champion. These are just some notable native people I'd kind of like to bring up. Wayne Newton. A lot of people don't realize that Wayne Newton is uh, a Powhatan Potawomac and a direct descendant of Pocahontas. And here he is when he came to Virginia. I was lucky enough to meet Mr. Wayne Newton and speak with him and interview him. Um, Michael Boucher, and he, he, by the way, his latest album just came out, this. Uh, and he has a track on there, One Finger, One Thumb, One Take. Check out the video on michaelboucher.com. He's a great, great guy, a Native American artist, musician who uh, actually something very interesting about Michael Boucher is recently, uh, about a year ago, lost three of his fingers on his guitar strumming hand. And um, this is what his hand looks like. And he could play this way with strumming and had to reteach himself how to play and was just uh, amazing if you hear his music now. Check him out, michaelboucher.com. Uh, we have Shoni Schimmel, who was WNBA player. Uh, Women's National Basketball Association player. Uh, Billy Mills, the Olympic gold medalist. Um, of course, Jean Brave Rock over here, the Native American in Wonder Woman. Jean Brave Rock was uh, Nappy, the, the Wonder, the, the Nappy, the demigod. So, uh, hope to see more from Jean. Uh, he's doing a lot more work still. Sonny Skyhawk, who is the creator of American Indians in, in television and film. Uh, very, very good guy. He's an actor and producer. Uh, and of course, we've got our our uh, our Iroquois Nationals here. You see playing, and, and these guys playing traditional games. And there's some Iroquois National fans. This was in Syracuse, New York, Onondaga Territory. That I took these photos. That was a great time. <laughs> and here's some just some cool Native folks, Native women, Native men. A couple of these young young ladies are Black Indians. There are a lot of and look at this woman here. How stoked she looks. A lot of Black Indians, especially in Virginia. And a lot of people don't realize just how prominent uh, black Indians are in American history. Uh, and according to the Wayanoak Association, about 85% of African Americans share uh, Native ancestry, especially here in Virginia. So uh, it's amazing. So you see this, this here is a jingle dress and, of course, women's traditional garb and things like that. So uh, some more Native folks here, Native families. Some great folks and friends of mine that I love dearly. I love this picture, little baby. Aww. And, uh, of course, we have a lot of folks in our LGBT two-spirit community. And these are four two-spirit, uh, you know, good good friends of mine, writers and artists, Tony Enos, uh, you know, and some, some just really amazing, wonderful, wonderful people who I love very much. Shawnee Talbot, uh, who I, 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 just, I just love them all. They're just really wonderful, great friends. Uh, of mine and great friends of, of uh, my show, Native Trailblazers, which is our radio show. Uh, we've got sports stars, uh, sports collegiate stars, Jude Schimmel, of course, uh, all these other players as well. And I just want to say thank you so very much. I hope you enjoyed my presentation today on Native American Heritage Month. You guys are awesome. Uh, you know, yes, it was. It was a good movie, wasn't it? He introduced himself to Blackfoot. I just think you guys are, are brilliant and wonderful. Follow me on Twitter, Vince Schilling, and please subscribe to my channel. I, I thank you all so very much uh, for, for, for coming in today and listening along. And if you have any questions, let me know. 
uh, Vince Schilling. You can go to twitter.com, uh, Vince, V-I-N-C-E, Schilling, S-C-H-I-L-L-I-N-G. You can ask me on Twitter, Vince Schilling, and uh, I, I just have to say thank you so much for listening. And if you could, uh, please hit the subscribe button and subscribe. I've got more great content coming, sometimes a live stream, sometimes some cool videos. Check out my other videos. I have one on Pocahontas, Columbus, uh, Native Appropriation, uh, and more, much, much more. So, uh, And I will continue to add more fun stuff to my channel. I appreciate you all so very much. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, thanks. I'm glad you watched the movie, VP. Yeah, and, and you know, and tomorrow night is Friday night. Make sure to listen in to Native Trailblazers. You can check us out. NativeTrailblazers.com is a website for our radio show. And uh, we'll be having a great, great uh, conversation tomorrow. And, um, you know, well, that's it. Uh, and you guys are really wonderful. I, I just really want to say thank you so very much for listening and, and watching. And uh, how much I appreciate you being there. And, um, you know, uh, you guys are amazing. Thank you so much. Ona and Na Wen. All the best. Take care. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and uh, end my stream now. You guys are wonderful, and I, I really do appreciate you all so very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Native Moon. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you all. Uh, yeah, all look, they all did look native back <laughs> So love you guys. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.